happening? You encouraged already? I'm, a, I'm encouraged. I'm renewed. I, uh, I don't really want to preach now. I don't. So I'm just going to be quick. Uh, just so you know, if you don't know who I am, my name is Corey. I'm part of the teaching team. I'm just honored to be in this place every single week. Uh, we're a unique church. If you haven't been around church or you've been around church and this is your first time around here, we're a very unique church because... Um, I believe that our job as pastors is to encourage you to remember that you're a pastor. You ain't ready for this. So our jobs as pastors is is to preach ourselves out of jobs so that you wake up to the reality that you have the same power that I have. You have the same responsibility that I have, that Rick over here is the pastor of insulated roofing. Anthony, you're the pastor of retirement. I just said your name because you're in front row, and then I didn't know where to go. <laughs> Dave Vaughn, you're the pastor of the Creamery in Louisville. Chris, you're the pastor of Solid Rock Construction, and every client you meet, you're the pastor of them. Ethan, you're the pastor of the freshman class of IU. Like, our job is to help you understand and awaken to the power that we all collectively possess, and when we all collectively do our own individual parts, man, the kingdom of God expands like never before, because the reality is, is hopefully you came to this place not because you feel like you had to, and hopefully you didn't come to this place because you feel like it's something you're supposed to do as a Christian. Hopefully you came to this place because you love the community here, but you also love the fact that when you come to this place, you know you're not going to get beat up. You're going to be encouraged and reminded about who you are and who you have always been. And and we've been in this sermon series called, What If I Told You? What If I Told You? It's our Easter series. And we're going through the book of Hebrews, and as 21st century Americans, oftentimes you read the scriptures not really understanding that they weren't written to you at all. But there are some significant truths in them that we can glean. And so you read the book of Hebrews and you don't understand the monumental things that were being communicated to the first century Jews. Like huge things. Week one, we talked about how Jesus is better than angels. And to you and I, angels, I don't know about you, but angels are insignificant to me. I don't really care to think about angels. You want to have that conversation. It doesn't really whet my appetite. I don't really care. Then last week, you know, Pastor Shanik talked about how Jesus is better than Moses. And so many Christians today don't understand this importance because if you grew up at a Christian school, uh, one of the statues that were in the front of your Christian school was uh, a Bible and it had the Ten Commandments on it. Thank God you didn't go to Christian school. (laughs) Although the Ten Commandments were good, they're not the law that we live by today. We live by the law of love. We live by understanding that every single person you meet is made in the image and likeness of God, and even if they're driving you crazy because they drive 10 miles an hour going up Mosher Knob, it's my job, (laughs) it's my job to see Jesus in them. That's funny, but let's talk about something real. The, The people that drive you up the wall at work and maybe at home, our job and responsibility is to see Jesus in them. And our job as 21st century Americans is not to live by the law of Moses, but to live by the law of Jesus and to love everyone, even the people that we disagree with. And that's hard to do. So I'm not here to sugarcoat that. But today, man, I love this conversation today because we're on week three of what if I told you? What if I told you that you are currently a high priest? Now, again, if you're an American, you're like, high priest, that's weird. Uh, The only thing I know about priesthood is like in Catholic church, if you like grew up with that. But you have to understand the message that this author was telling the Hebrew Christians in the first century that they were high priests was like heresy. It felt weird. It felt like it shouldn't be said. It felt wrong. It, It felt like Are you sure? Because we know who the high priest is, and none of us are Levites, which was the the Levitical priesthood. You had to be a Levite to be a priest. And I'm going to show you today uh, how the author of Hebrews shared this reality to us and what it means in the 21st century. Again, it wasn't written to you, but it is written for you. And last week, Pastor Shanik made fun of me about how I gave him an assignment with a ton of scripture to read. Well, I think My portion this morning is a lot more scripture than he read last week. So if you're bored from reading scriptures, I apologize. You can take a nap. You're good. No worries. But uh, I'm going to preach differently than I like to preach. We're going to go through the scripture. This is called, what's this called, Austin? What what do people call this? Exegetical preaching. I hate exegetical preaching. Can I say that? I, I hate it. Jesus never did it. 
So uh, I don't want to do it, but we're going to do it this morning. So I'm going to read a couple portions of scripture, and we're going to talk about it. And I've said this joke the last like three weeks in a row, so I'm going to say it again. But if you haven't read your Bible in a while, you're good, okay? I'm going to read enough scripture for the rest of the year for you, okay? You can smile a little bit in church, you know? You want me to look at you, make eye contact, make you uncomfortable? We're going to have fun this morning. You ready? If you got your Bible, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 is going to be on the screen behind me. I'm going to stop in a lot of places, and I'm just going to get going because this is a boring passage of Scripture, but I'm going to try and make it fun. Is that cool? Are you good with that? Can you talk back to me this morning? Cool. All right. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Uh, Therefore, we got to stop right there. Therefore. So whenever you come, I I used to have this preacher I grew up under. He said, whenever you see it, therefore, you got to read, what's it? Therefore, okay, I hate that joke, so I'm not going to say that joke. <laughs> but what's it there for? If you remember, Pastor Shannon closed his, his sermon last week talking about Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 to 13. And if, if you grew up in church, you heard this verse all the time. It, it says, the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, and it continues. My whole life, I was told that that is a Bible verse about the Bible. It's not. This book is not alive and active. It's a book. Okay? I'm going to step on some toes real quick. My whole life, I was told that the Word of God is alive and active. And I used to hear preachers tell me that when you read the Bible, it's the only book that reads you. That doesn't even make sense if you think about it. (laughs) John chapter 1 tells us that Jesus became the Word of God. The Word of God became flesh. Jesus is the Word of God. So when Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says the Word of God is alive and active, he's talking about not the written Word of God, he's talking about the living Word of God, Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is alive and active and he lives in you. And this is powerful if you would wake up to it. Because if you recognize that you're alive and active, not just literally, but spiritually, man, you can't help but see the good in people even while knowing all their dirt. So the the author is is continuing this thought. Therefore, because Jesus is alive and active and because he lives in you, wake up. And he continues, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Are you picking up what I'm, I'm picking up? That's a crazy verse, that Jesus was tempted in every way that you and I are tempted. Because I got a lot of questions then. If Jesus was tempted every way that I'm tempted? Okay, I'll keep it PG. I know there's kids in here. We'll continue. All right, we're good. I'm encouraged by that verse. And he did not sin. Look at this, verse 16. I love this. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with what? With what? Confidence. Mm. Man, I know a lot of Christians who aren't confident. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. My friends, it's not that you approach his throne of grace with confidence, that you find grace and mercy. It's that when you wake up to the confidence that has been given to you because of Christ, you understand that his mercy and his grace has always been there. There are far too many Christians in the American church today who do not understand confidence, and I blame the church. Because the church told us that if you're humble, you're not supposed to raise your hand, even though Moses wrote about himself in the Torah that he was the most humble man that ever lived. The church told me that Oh, all for God. Thank, praise. You know, Brittany, you're such a good singer. Oh, it's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. No, girl, you got some pipes. D, you are a phenomenal leader. Oh, praise Jesus. It's just Jesus. And if you get around Christians who are offended by that, it's because they've been told their whole life, their whole life, they've misunderstood proper humility. Proper humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less, which means that you are supposed to think highly of yourself, not in an arrogant way, but because of what Jesus did. And this is impo- it's impossible for it to create pride in your life because you didn't make yourself amazing. Jesus made you amazing when he created you. 
And we got a bunch of Christians walking around acting like they're not good enough. And so guess what? When you act like you don't, that you're not good enough, your whole thought process is about you. I wonder what they, what they meant when they said that to me. Boo, they're not thinking about you. They just said it and moved on. They're thinking about them. No one's thinking about you as much as you think about you and as much as you think people think about you. I, I lay my head down at night and I'm like, man, I wonder what, hmm, I wonder how many people are. No, no one's thinking about me. Not even my wife. She's asleep already. Come on, can we just be real for a minute? If the church would wake up to who they have always been, I promise you people would be attracted to the message that we actually preach. But we walk around going, oh, I'm not good enough. No, God the Father created you for you to wake up and realize that he appointed you as a high priest in the 21st century, and you need to understand you're good enough. You need to understand that you're worthy. And if this was a problem in the first century, man, I wish it wasn't a problem in the 21st century if we would just understand who we are. So therefore, I, I used to get this picture. I'm going I'm to come down and make it, make it funny, okay? I, I used to have this picture that you approach the father, right, with this. Oh, you know what I'm talking about? The only people that are laughing have grown up in the church. I'm, I'm a pastor's kid, just so you know. Like, oh, duh. Ah, because he's this judge. God doesn't want to be a judge in your life. In fact, there's scripture verses all throughout John that says he doesn't come to judge anybody. What? That would throw some of your theology out the window. Right. <laughs> he's a father, and he's good. And he wants you to approach his throne, which is really understanding that his throne is in you, and he's been seated on it since the day you were born, and he wants you to wake up to the goodness of who you have always been. He wants you to approach him as, hey, Dad, yo, I'm struggling. He wants you to be real. Hey, hey Dad, guess what happened in my life? Hey, hey, Dad, guess what? Guess what? You'll never believe this. I finally woke up and realized that I was the perfected righteousness of Christ. So when I went to school in the morning, I started calling out everybody and saying, hey, you're not a bad person just because you do this, but you're better than that, and you got the righteousness of Christ inside you too. What would happen if we started walking around with actual confidence, and not in your good looks because you'll get wrinkly, and not in your athletic ability because you'll tear your ACL? Sorry, Isaac. We'll pray for that in Jesus' name. <laughs> and not in your academics, because guess what? That'll fade. And not because you made a whole lot of money, because that'll be gone. And so the only place that we can actually find confidence is resting and knowing who our dad is, and therefore who we are. Yeah. Come on, this is, this is amazing. He continues this thought in chapter 5. He says, every high priest, now this is a whole bunch of boring stuff, so I'm just going to read it real fast. Is that Okay. They're talking about high priest stuff. You know what? I might just skip it. You cool with me if I skip it? Yeah, yeah I got nods. Oh, we got, we got a fun church if you're like, just skip it. It's just talking about like first century high priest stuff. They're, they're trying to help his audience understood because they understood what high priests were. Aaron was the high priest. He was the brother of Moses. Okay, so when Moses gets the Ten Commandments, he appoints his brother as the high priest. Not really, but like they throw these sticks in a tent, and the next morning they wake up, and Aaron's stick had almonds on it. And I could preach a whole sermon on almonds, but the reality is, is God was like, I want Aaron, even though he's Moses' brother. And Aaron, uh, Aaron was this jacked up dude. He was just a high priest. He sinned too. And so the high priest was responsible every single year to sacrifice a perfected animal so that it would forgive his sins and the sins of their nation. And this was like something they did every single year, every single year, every single year. So you send, oh, well, Aaron's going to sacrifice a goat maybe in six months, and we're going to be good. And the, every single year, every single year. And then Jesus shows up on the scene, and the author, and, and the scriptures say Jesus is the once and for all sacrifice, which thank God that we don't have to sacrifice any animals, because Peter would be all up in our business today. Thank God. And, and you know, there's people in Israel trying to go back to sacrifices. And I'm like, Why? Why, why would you want to go back to sacrifice? You're putting Jesus back up on the cross, and he got down 2,000 years ago and got up to live in you. So that you would wake up that you're a high priest. So that's what he's talking about. He's talking about this high priest used to, you know, sacrifice sins not just for the people but for himself because he wasn't perfected. But now Jesus is amazing. So I, I, I'm, where am I going to skip? All the way down, da 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 During the days of Jesus, verse 7. Just skip down to verse 7. You got that? During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. is just the word honor in the Greek. Because of his honor. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Talking about death on the cross. Isn't it interesting that Jesus knows exactly what it feels like to pray to the Father and hear the Father's answer, no? 
You ever thought about that? Because I hear no a lot. And sometimes when I get further on in life, I look back and say, thank God, God answered my prayers with a no. Because I'd be married to some crazy. I'll leave that right there. Verse 9. And once made perfect, this is the Greek word mature or complete. And they're talking about salvation. Salvation happened 2,000 years ago. It doesn't happen when you accept Jesus. Salvation happened 2,000 years ago. It's your job to wake up to the fact that you have been whole, perfected, and completed because of what Jesus did. It was amazing. Once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey. Terrible translation. I don't know if you follow uh, my girl Mikey, Derek's wife, on social media. She put out this post this past week just talk, unpacking the word obey from Hebrews. It just means the one who listens. Obedience isn't behavior. It's just, huh, that makes sense. And when you hear something that makes sense and it changes the way you live, I'll give you an example. Hey, you're a high priest. And some of you in this room will go, huh, that makes sense. And it'll change the way you live because you recognize you're not trying out for a position in the kingdom of God. You already have it. Right. And you're a, a son. Friends, do not hope to hear these words when you meet God face to face. Well done, good and faithful servant. There's no more hope in that. You already are a good and faithful servant because the good and faithful servant lives in you. You don't have to worry about whether or not God's going to look at you and find favor. He already has because of Jesus. And this is the most, this is why you can approach God with confidence. Say, hey, God, I screwed up this week. He goes, it's all good. You're my son. And guess what? Jesus already paid for it. Wake up to your responsibility. Wake up to who you've always been. Wake up to your high priesthood and start living like a high priest. Oh, man. You can tell I, get, I, I like this stuff. Verse 10, and was designated by God to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Come back next week and hear my man, Austin, unpack Melchizedek. It's a weird figure. Verse 11, we have much to say about this. I want you to check this verse out. But it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. Okay? Now, if you have a Bible in print, the heading will say, a warning against falling away. And... You want to know what I was taught, what was falling away when I was growing up in church? Drinking, doing stupid stuff, backslidden. You grew up with that word? Oh, don't you be backsliding, backsliding Christian. Do you know what it means to backslide? It means to go back to thinking that your performance is what makes you righteous. That's backsliding. Falling away from grace is saying, hey, God, your grace is sufficient, but let me do it by myself over here so that I can earn your grace. That ain't the gospel. Your performance has already been perfected by the performance of the perfect one, and now he lives in you. So guess what? You are already perfected in Christ today as you stand in your sin because your sin does not define you. Jesus does. This is what produces confidence. This is what helps you walk out of this church and remind yourself, okay, you might be struggling or dealing or expressing or experiencing some suffering and pain, but guess what? It does not define you. You're defined by the Son of God, Jesus, and therefore, because of who Jesus is, who is your brother, you are the sons and daughters of God, and this is permanent. We have much to say about this, but it is hard for you to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. Why do you no longer try to understand? Because you are obsessed with having this measuring stick to make you feel good about your own salvation so you look at other people because they do things you don't. And he's about to unpack exactly this to prove my point. He's going to talk about the Ten Commandments. You would rather checklist your life saying, look at me, God, I obey all Ten Commandments. And God's like, it's not about obeying the Ten Commandments. It's about loving your neighbor well. Because if you love your neighbor well, you ain't going to be murdering people. So don't get offended that I said the Ten Commandments are kapush. What I'm saying is the law of love accomplishes the ten. The law of love actually challenges you to go above and beyond to love people that are hard to love, even in your own household. Come on, I got young kids. You can relate to that? Front row people are helping me out this morning. The rest of you are acting like your kids aren't crazy. In fact, verse 12, in fact, though this time you ought to be teachers... Though this time you ought to understand your priesthood, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's words. That elementary truth, if you look it up in the Greek, it's the Ten Commandments. 
So guess what milk is? I'll keep reading to prove it to you. You need milk, not solid food, the Ten Commandments. Anyone who lives on milk is still being, am I saying that right? Milk, because I, I, I get told I say milk weird, milk, milk, milk. Anyone who lives on milk, still being an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. Anybody that is going back to the Ten Commandments or the law of, of the Old Testament, the law of Moses, is, is drinking milk. You're an immature infant, and you need to wake up that your righteousness has been a gift to you. You can't earn it. That's what solid food is. Solid food is you waking up and going, I'm the righteousness of Christ, and it is the most humble thing you could ever say. Why is it the most humble thing you could ever say to say, I'm the righteousness of Christ? It's because Jesus died so that you could be righteous. And to say that you're not righteous is to slap him in the face and put him back on the cross. And we have a lot of 21st century Americans thinking that it's humble, but what they're doing is putting Jesus back on the cross. He got down 2,000 years ago for you to wake up. He continues. But solid food is for the mature. Solid food is for the complete solid food is for salvation. Again, salvation is waking up that you are already whole and complete in Christ. You're already complete. You're not waiting to get to heaven to be complete. Heaven is waiting for you to recognize that you already are complete to bring heaven to earth. It's so good. Who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Chapter 6. You ready? I'm just going to fly through this. Therefore, what's it there for, right? Therefore, because you've awakened to your priesthood and because you're mature, because you understand your completion and righteousness comes from Christ and Christ alone, you have finally owned it. It's not arrogant. It's actually what causes proper humility. Because of this, therefore, let us move beyond the Ten Commandments, the elementary teachings about Christ and begin to and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance. Check this out, okay? Because they do a terrible job translating these things. These are, these are what like churches are like contradictory in churches. And the first century Hebrew author understood that it was still going to be an issue because people love to debate things in the church that don't matter. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. This is like useless rituals. If you're in the 80s, this might be waving flags. No, no offense. No offense if you grew up in a church like that. And of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites. This is baptism. If you look it up in the uh, original, original Greek, they're talking about people dividing over baptism. Hey, if you want to get sprinkled, if you want to get dunked, if you want to... Uh, however, if you want to have a water balloon fight and consider it baptism, let's do it. it. It's not about being dunked or fully emerged and it's like, oh, your nose was still above water. Not, not good. Do it again. Dunk them again. It, you know, people divide whether or not you said God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, dunk, or whether you just said in the name of Jesus, dunk. People divide over that. And Hebrews is telling us why. It don't matter. If, if they had water balloons in Jesus' time, I believe Jesus would have been like, you're baptized, bam, and been hitting, smoking people with water balloons. Like, it don't matter. He continues, the laying on of hands. Again, I'm not saying baptism isn't a bad thing. It's a great thing. It's a public declaration that you're, you're following Jesus, but how you get baptized doesn't matter. Laying on of hands is great. If you don't want hands laid on you, that's okay. We go from afar. What's up? You good? Lay hand. If you want some hands laid on you, we'll lay hands on you because it doesn't matter. You have power. If you want to lay hands on yourself, man, if you hear nothing else, hear that as you walk out this place because of your high priesthood, you can lay hands on yourself. Some of you are going to make it real weird. Be like, I don't know. I just made it real weird. That's what I thought about. I apologize for this. The resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. You know that that word eternal literally just means age long. He was talking about the judgment of 70 AD that was about to happen in their future, but it's in our past. <laughs> Guys, you don't have to be scared about judgment because John tells us that all judgment was put on Jesus at the cross. So if you're scared of a future judgment, it's because you've been told lies and you've misapplied something that was written to people 2,000 years ago that already happened. Yeah. You were judged in Jesus, and guess what the declaration then therefore says about you? 
because of the judgment of Jesus, he declares you righteous permanently. That's the judgment, that you would wake up. And, and I learned this in our court case. Uh, three years ago today, do you know this, babe? Three years ago today, March 20th, we, had, uh, we started the adoption process of our son. And we were in the courtroom three years ago today in the courtroom. And the judge stood up and he said, I declare a judgment in favor of the Rice family that they can begin the adoption process. And then he hit the gavel. And the revelation of judgment blew up in my mind because I always had associated judgment with something negative. But the judgment in this case was in favor. Guess what the judgment is in your case? Favor. You're the perfected righteousness of Christ. There's nothing to fear. He continues, verse 4. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. He says, it's impossible. If you recognize that because Jesus lives in you and the Holy Spirit is alive and active in you, it's impossible for you, once you've experienced that reality, for you to go back and say, ah, I, that was cool for a season, but I think I can do it better by doing X, Y, and Z. Because once you taste the goodness of the Holy Spirit in your life, you can't help but share it to everybody. Because it actually is good news. And who have fallen away, who have fallen away? It's when you go back away from the Holy Spirit to say, I'm, I'm going to try and do it on my own. Fall away and be brought back to repentance to their loss. Look at this. What I just said, they said it in the Bible. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. When you refuse to accept that you are the perfected, completed righteousness of Jesus right now, as you are, even in your sin, you are putting Jesus back on the cross. That should make us wake up to this reality because the only thing it will produce is not arrogance. It'll produce this confidence of knowing that you're a son or a daughter of God. Therefore, you stop doing stupid church rituals and stupid things that you were taught is what brings favor. You can't earn or gain more favor. You're already favored. You can't earn or gain more blessings. You're already blessed. We become blessings when you get this revelation. You become the person that meets the needs in your office. You become the person that starts reading people and you learn how people are. And even if they have an RBF, you can approach them and say, hey, are you doing all right? I'm looking at my wife. And if you don't know what that means, ask your kids. They'll tell you what it is. Verse 9. Continue to verse 9. I'm going to skip ahead because I'm going to close. Uh, Britt, you wanna, um, do you have a piano? Is it on? Come make me sound beautiful. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case and the things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. Unjust. He will not show, whoa, I can read. He will not forget your work and the love that you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Again, he's talking to first century Jews. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end, talking about the end of the age, which was about to happen in 70 AD. This book was written in 62 to 64 AD, so it was about to happen in six years. We want you to show the same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. Again, they're transitioning out of understanding this idea that they had a high priest that they had to go to every single year to gain uh, salvation, to gain forgiveness. And Jesus had already died like 30 years prior and they're still struggling with this reality that they are the already perfected righteousness of Christ because of the once and for all salvation of Jesus, because of the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus. We do not want you to become lazy but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Inherit what has been. Are you, are you turning it on? Make me sound real good. I'm about to be real good as we land this plane. There it is. Beautiful. So as I, as I close, I want you to wake up to this. Jesus is better than the high priest Aaron. And because Jesus is better than the high priest Aaron, that means you and I today currently are high priests. And this might not mean something significant because we didn't really grow up with this like high priesthood thing in 21st century American culture. Let me put it this way. That verse talks about inheritance. Many of you know that inheritance happens when somebody dies. You don't gain an inheritance until somebody dies. Spiritually, that person died 2,000 years ago. We're going to celebrate it on Easter in just a couple weeks. But you know that Jesus isn't rising, raising, getting up in a couple weeks. 
He got up 2,000 years ago. So Easter is just a celebration of what already is. You and I are already currently walking and living in the inheritance of Jesus because Jesus died 2,000 years ago so that you and I could no longer swift and sway about whether or not we're good enough, whether or not we're worthy. Jesus is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, and he lives and moves in you. You are the high priest, and it's your job to wake up to this responsibility that you are the pastor of your area of influence, that your job isn't to look down on people. Your job isn't to confront people's sin. Your job is to remind people that they are the perfected, permanent righteousness of Jesus, and it produces this real confidence that doesn't get shaken when your outside circumstances get bad news. It, you can have confidence when you're walking through trials. You can have confidence when you're walking through chaos. You can have confidence when you're walking through the unknown because you know who you are. So when you come to this church, you will never get beat up because that's not our job. Our job is to remind you about who you are. Our job is to remind you of the power of Jesus that lives in you so that you can go and deal with your own stuff on your car ride home so that you can get this confidence that can change the way that you interact with humanity so that people will actually be interested in what we believe because of how well we love. What if I told you you're a high priest? What if I told you you're already perfected and completed in Christ? What if I told you you are the perfected righteousness of God and it's time for us to live like it because when you live like it, you don't do whatever you want. You start seeing people in light of who they are and you're able to pull that out of them. You're able to say, hey, I know you're dealing with some stuff. Can I, can I be that person to walk with you through this? Hey, you're amazing. Hey, you're beautiful. Hey, you're fun. Hey, you do a really good job at presenting these things at work so that it makes sense to me because I fake it. Like I know what's going on. That ain't you? That, that, yeah, yeah, me too, Lauren. Wait, you're a pastor. What? Oops, let me pray. You good? Is that good for you? What if I told you Jesus is better than the high priest and Jesus lives in you, therefore you're the high priest. To walk in the inheritance that is already yours, you just have to grab it. That's why belief and faith is so important because if you don't know you're righteous, you'll never live righteous. So let me pray for you this morning. Father, I thank you so much that you're better. And because you're better and because you live in us, that we're better. We're better than sin. We're a better way to love. We can start looking at people in a different light. And we can start making this kingdom thing blow up like never before because we understand and we take responsibility for who we are. and We are the righteousness of Christ. We thank you that you are better. We praise you. We give you worship this morning. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Corey. That was so good. Can we just give it up for Corey real quick? Thank you so much. And I love that message because as we grasp our identity, we're able to better walk out our responsibility as sons and daughters to love those around us. Matter of fact, I, I wanna pull up one thing real quick before we close. Um, Sarah, if you could get verse 10 back up on the screen of chapter six, verse 10. Um, under the law, the greatest commandment, and Jesus tells us this as he was having a conversation with a teacher of the law one day, the greatest commandment was love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. But under the new covenant and in the new covenant kingdom, how we show our love to God is how we love other people. Matter of fact, even in this verse, it says God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you've shown him. Well, what love have you shown him? as you've helped his people and continue to help them. That's the greatest commandment. That's the law of love. That's our responsibility as a high priest in new covenant kingdom, to love as he loved us. And as we love people, that shows our amazing love for God. Amen. Amen. Well, so as you leave this place, just be empowered in that. Walk out your responsibility to love those around you well, wherever that's at. And just so you guys know for yourself, you are loved and there's nothing you can do about it. We'll see you next Sunday.